Hello Pashmaloos! Today I'm diving into the exciting discussion of whether Dark Souls 1 is genuinely a metroidvania. I know, I know, just mentioning it might spark a bonfire in the comments. But hold your fire bombs before you rush to the comments to argue that I might as well label Elden Ring a Mario-like. Let me clarify, this video is meant for lighthearted debate. Although I do think that Dark Souls 1 is a metroidvania and I'm going to prove it to you all in this video. Let's get him, boys! But hey, this is a dialogue, not a monologue. Watch the video, weigh the evidence, and then let me know in the comments. Can you convince me otherwise, or will I convert you to my side? Let's find out. I will start by providing a concise definition of the metroidvania genre to ensure we are all on the same page. There are many definitions of this genre, but the one I will use is from Wikipedia. Notably, this definition aligns with the one used by the metroidvania subreddit, whose members are likely to be the most discerning audience. According to Wiki, Metroidvania is a subgenre of action-adventure games and slash or platformers focused on guided non-linearity and utility-gated exploration and progression. As we scroll down, Wiki expands on this definition, stating, These games usually feature a large interconnected world map the player can explore, although parts of the world will be inaccessible to the player until they acquire special items, tools, weapons, abilities, or knowledge within the game. Acquiring such improvements can also aid the player in defeating more difficult enemies and locating shortcuts and secret areas, and often includes retracing one's steps across the map. It also adds that these elements lead to the integration of the story and help with player's connection to its character through role-playing elements. And of course, Metroidvanias can be 3D too. With that said, don't worry folks, throughout this video I will dissect each component and demonstrate how Dark Souls fulfills these criteria. The first element to cover is the guided map design, which invites players to explore the map in a non-linear manner, often necessitating backtracking. This concept was initially introduced by Below the Root in 1984 and later brought into the mainstream by Metroid in 1986. It involves revisiting previously inaccessible areas that become explorable through various means, a subject I will explore later in this video. I still have a vague memory of my first steps into Firelink Shrine, the initial area in Dark Souls 1, after completing the tutorial. Upon conversing with the crestfallen warrior nearby, I learned about two bells I needed to ring. One's up above in the undead church, the other is far, far below, in the ruins at the base of Blight Town. After a quick survey of the surroundings, I decided to ascend the stairs directly in front of me intuitively drawn upwards. While seasoned Dark Souls players are aware of multiple starting routes, the game subtly encourages newcomers to take this path. Unlike the conspicuous stairs, the other paths are well hidden, requiring extensive exploration to discover. You can see the availability of a branching pathway from the very start. It just needs a bit more exploration. Some might argue that the availability of different routes from the beginning is against the nature of a Metroidvania game. Nevertheless, these paths hint at future exploration rather than immediate progression. For instance, if you choose to descend, you'll encounter New Londo, a challenging area even later in the game. After being attacked by invincible enemies and realizing you can't swim, you'll likely seek an alternative path. Similarly, heading left from the Firelink Shrine leads you to the Catacombs, where indestructible skeletons deter new players. This is Dark Souls 1's subtle method of steering players through its complex map design. These soft locks serve to deepen immersion and lend a natural feel to progression. Of course, there are numerous hard-locked areas like Sense Fortress, which is accessible only through specific means, necessitating backtracking later on for progression. The map design in Dark Souls 1 creates the illusion of an open world despite its structured nature. The game features a web of interconnected paths, concealed walls, and meticulously crafted areas that facilitate the player's progression seamlessly and organically. As players delve deeper, the game subtly directs them along essential routes, fostering a sense of personal discovery. Moreover, the design integrates backtracking as a natural aspect of the journey. Without a doubt, Dark Souls 1's map design embodies the guided non-linear approach characteristic of Metroidvania games, complete with the essential backtracking. The Metroidvania genre as we know it today truly took shape in 1997 with the release of Castlevania Symphony of the Night. This game, 
drawing inspiration from the iconic Legend of the Zelda series, made significant contributions to the genre, most notably by introducing RPG elements. These included an experience system and a diverse array of weapons that players could choose from to suit their individual playstyles. This innovative approach to game design fostered a more engaging and personalized experience, setting the stage for future titles to expand upon these concepts. One such title was Dark Souls 1. In Dark Souls 1, players embark on a journey through the Kingdom of Lord Run, with the freedom to play as a mage, fighter, cleric, among many other classes. The game offers a vast selection of weapons, spells, and armor, allowing for cross-matching and creating almost infinite ways to play the game. This level of customization has led to the creation of numerous YouTube channels dedicated solely to showcasing various builds. But why bring this up? A debate within the gaming community centered around the classification of Dark Souls 1 has been simmering. Some argue that its RPG elements are too pronounced for it to fit neatly into the Metroidvania category. However, it is important to recognize that many beloved Metroidvania games have long embraced RPG elements to varying degrees. For example, in Hollow Knight, you can customize your character through different charms, shaping it in a way that correlates with your playstyle. Or in Ender Lilies, you gain experience and level up, thus gaining more damage and HP, which are crucial for late game. Dark Souls 1 didn't just incorporate these elements, it refined and amplified them, setting a new standard for the genre. Unlike autism, there isn't an RPG spectrum that once the game surpasses a certain point, we should disregard all other aspects and deny its Metroidvania title. Instead, it's precisely these RPG elements that enable Dark Souls 1 to offer a distinctive and enriching game experience. The game invites players to delve into its world and experiment with different strategies and approaches, which is nothing new in Metroidvanias. However, Dark Souls does it so well that it is perceived as entirely new. In the Metroidvania genre, level progression is often tied to the acquisition of new game elements that unlock previously inaccessible areas crucial for advancement. In this section, my discussion will center on the level progression in Dark Souls 1 and its alignment with the Metroidvania framework. For many people, this is the part that leads to excluding Dark Souls 1 from the Metroidvania genre. As we read earlier, Wikipedia's definition of progression is, these games usually feature a large interconnected world map the player can explore, although parts of the world will be inaccessible to the player until they acquire special items, tools, weapons, abilities, or knowledge within the game. Dark Souls 1 masterfully embodies these concepts through a variety of mechanisms that enable player progression. Take for instance, Sense for to open its doors, players must ring two bells guarded by bosses. Here the bells act as special items unlocking the path forward. Once the bells have tolled, players must retrace their steps to the undead parish to find the newly accessible entrance to Sen's fortress. Another pivotal item in Dark Souls 1 is the Lord Vessel. Together with the souls of four distinct bosses, Seth the Scaleless, the Bed of Chaos, Grave Lord Nito, and the Four Kings, it unlocks the Kiln of the First Flame. This endgame area near Firelink shrine becomes accessible only after obtaining all the required items. Moreover, to fight the four kings, players must defeat the great grey wolf Seth to acquire the Artorius Covenant Ring, which is necessary to enter the abyss located in the New Londo ruins. This area, accessible early in the game, becomes explorable only after acquiring the ring. These instances exemplify the game's reliance on special items for progression, compelling players to revisit previous locations to advance their journey. Despite these examples, some might argue that the progression in Dark Souls 1, overwhelmed by RPG elements and reliant on key-based progression, deviates from the Metroidvania genre. Critics might point out the lack of abilities or power-ups essential for progression, arguing that this absence invalidates its Metroidvania identity. But does Dark Souls 1 really lack the abilities and power-ups that are essential for progression? This is where the discussion takes a creative turn. Some may argue that I'm stretching the boundaries, but it's precisely this gray area that fueled my interest in making this video. Drawing parallels from the anime world, Asta of Black Clover and Mash Burn Dead of Mashal Magic and Muscles epitomize the concept of leveling up or strength training in a fantastical context. These narratives revolve around protagonists devoid of magical prowess 
prowess who nonetheless rise to dominate a magic-centric universe. They exemplify the notion that sheer strength can defy the odds. Dark Souls 1 echoes this theme. The core of the game hinges on leveling up and amassing strength to defeat bosses that impede progress, bosses that are gatekeepers to the very items key for advancement. What I'm trying to say is leveling up in Dark Souls 1 is equivalent to power-ups. Having enough points to wield that strong dex weapon or an overpowered 200 strength weapon is comparable to gaining new abilities. Now, one might argue there are many players who can complete the entire game without leveling up. We've even seen players beat Dark Souls 1 while naked. You don't have to level up. However, this is not how the game was intended to be played. Consider Hollow Knight, a standout example of the Metroidvania genre. Players can acquire the Dream Nail and work towards the ending within the first 10 minutes of gameplay through a tactic known as Shade Skipping. This allows us to skip a significant amount of backtracking. Yet, this isn't the typical gameplay experience, nor is it how the game was intended to be played. By the same logic, does this exclude Hollow Knight from being a Metroidvania? The same applies to Dark Souls 1. The intended progression is reflected in the first time player experience, which is filled with grinding and trial and error. This brings me to my final point about progression, which involves using knowledge gained within the game to advance. The trial and error aspect of Dark Souls 1 is essential for progression. It equips us with knowledge about different mobs and bosses, as well as secret pathways necessary for navigating through the game. One might even go far and say that each boss fight is like a puzzle ready to be solved through many attempts. This knowledge-based progression is what decides if a player will beat the game. Some are not up for the challenge to analyze and learn from their mistakes thus lacking the knowledge to progress, leading to them leaving the game unfinished. This element, intertwined with RPG features and the quest for special items, renders Dark Souls 1's progression both complex and distinctive. Its uniqueness is so pronounced that it challenges conventional recognition within the Metroidvania genre. Dark Souls 1 feels like an entirely different genre, but upon closer examination, it reveals its Metroidvania DNA. While the game pushes the boundaries of the Metroidvania genre, recognizing its lineage simply requires an open-minded perspective. I have one question for you. If Dark Souls 1 was exactly the same, but in 2D, would you have a different perspective? With that said, this is all I have for you. Whether I have convinced you or not, I look forward to reading what you think. Thank you if you made it this far to the video. Have a lovely day.